Welcome to ETF Market Insights, a weekly show focusing on the evolving world of ETF investing. Each Friday, a new panel of thought leaders aims to provide investment education and insights with the goal of helping you become an informed investor. Make sure to visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights to watch previous episodes. And remember to hit subscribe so you receive a notification when we post new content and when we go live each Friday. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. This is ETF Market Insights. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Danielle Nuzzle with BMO ETFs. It's so great to have you with us again this week. I want to give a big shout out to all our investors out there and our audience that showed up to our first ever in-person event. We hosted a really fun time over at the Toronto Stock Exchange a couple weeks ago. We uh, rang the bell and opened the market. We had some great educational panels and it was so great to connect with you all and talk with you all in person. Who else was at that event? It was Chris Heeks. He's back with us today. He's a portfolio manager at, at BMO ETFs as well. Um, we had a really good time, didn't we, Chris? Yeah, it was good. We had some good debates, you know, ETF picks. Uh, you know, I, 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 uh, my pick didn't win the day, but uh, great conversation. Nice to see everybody and, and get everybody together was, was excellent. That was great. We're going to do more events like that, so stay tuned. Before we get started on today's topic, a reminder, as always, we're not providing you any advice today. We're not providing you any investment recommendations. This channel and all our shows are about empowering DIY investors and providing high-level education to help you guide your own investment decisions. Chris and I thought a great topic for today would be to talk about the S&P 500 because it has been making a lot of headlines and why? Well, it's hit some all-time highs this month. Just looking at this week, you know, it's been going up and down over that 5,000 that five thousand mark, Chris. But um, exciting times for U.S. equity markets. What's been driving uh, so much performance and success in the S&P 500 so far this year? Yeah, for sure. And, and great to be back here again. And nice to talk about the S&P 500. Um, really the the big dog, if you will, of, of investing in general. And, you know, a lot of times we, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting products, a lot of products that can improve your portfolio, but, you know, I think hopefully, uh, you know, after we get through a conversion, the core can never be ignored. I know that because I just did a fitness class today and I think I've been ignoring my core. So you got to work on your core. Um, but, uh, you know, why is the S and P 500? So, you know, it, it almost answers its own question. You know, we know what a power the U S is in, in global economics, you know, the top economy in the world, developed economy in the world. Um, you know, one thing we've seen kind of recently is that economy is still chugging along. So, you know, at this point last year, you know, a lot of strategists were, uh, you know, calling for the recession, not our word. And typically you do tend to see an economic slowdown at the end of a rate hiking cycle. And that was seemed to be the consensus, but you look at the economic data and it continues to chug along. So, uh, you know, most recently, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, the Q4 GDP print in the U S it came in at 3.3% annualized. And that was versus an expectation of only 2.0%, which still would have been not bad 2%, but came in at 33 so uh, really outperforming versus expectations, you know, along with that, we've seen inflation being coming down in recent months and you heard the U S federal reserve, you know, towards the end of last year in November, start to talk a little bit more about rate cuts as we move you know, further into 2024, you know, that was really seized on by the market was really a. Uh, you know, I would say one of the signature moments of the market last year where the Fed opened the door to rate cuts, uh, because with inflation normalizing, you know, you don't have to keep rates so high. You can bring them down maybe a, a percent or so and still be, you know, if the rates come down from 5% to 4% and inflation's at three and trending down, you don't need to have your foot on the gas, so to speak, with the interest rates. So the market received that really positively in Q4. It's continuing to spill over. Uh, we just got some economic out da uh, data out uh, this uh, this morning, day before, that was showing again more kind of easing in, in, in inflation, 
uh, data. So that's good to see. That's been seized on positively by equity investors um, as lower interest rates potentially can stimulate businesses. So, um, you know, so those are those are some of the some of the reasons. And you know, as we get into, I mean, we're going to talk more about some of the companies under the hood. Um, it's not just a strong economy; it's also really strong companies um, that we all know. Uh, Apple, right here, you know, Google that I'm on right now as we as we record this, and and so on and so forth. Very strong companies in the S and P 500 that have been obviously a key component of this success. Great, great segue to my next question for you, Chris. So let's talk a little bit about the Magnificent Seven. It used to be the Fang stocks. Now we've moved on. It's the Magnificent Seven. They have been, you know, the driving force for this index and for U.S. equity markets for a, a little while now. Uh, some investors, you know, they want a lot of exposure to these companies. Some investors wonder, is there too much exposure to these companies in something like a S&P 500? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I think anytime you start to hear a lot of noise around a theme, I think it's healthy to be, you know, to be cautious and, and look at what you're getting. So why don't we name the Magnificent Seven to start? And I'm going to go in order from the highest weight in the S&P 500 down to the lowest. So we've got Microsoft at 7%. Uh, then we go down to Apple. Then we've got NVIDIA, the new kid on the block in the top five, so to speak. Then we have Amazon. Google, Google, there's actually two lines of Google in the index, but if we add it together, Google's in the number uh, five spot there. Then we have Meta. And then last one is Tesla. Now, there are some people arguing that it should be the Magnificent Six, not the Magnificent Seven, because Tesla hasn't been so magnificent uh, in, in 2023. Uh, but we'll put that aside, you know, big driver, so to speak, no pun intended, uh, you know, of the index for sure. Now, if you add that up, so Microsoft is at seven, Tesla is at 1.3%. You add up those top seven stocks, you're at about 28.7%. Now, when I started in ETFs, it was 2011. I believe that the top stock was Exxon Mobile, uh, which I don't, which is not in the top 10 anymore, but Exxon was a top stock. I believe it was just over 2%. It was a big moment when Apple took over Exxon. So Yes, the, the S&P 500 has become more concentrated over time. Again, the top stock 13 years ago was, was just over 2%. That said, here's some food for thought. Look at Let's look at our Canadian market, stock market. Uh, we know the big banks dominate and railroads and telecoms, et cetera. Uh, the top weight in the Canadian stock market, uh, okay, I'm going to say it, Royal Bank, number one, 6.1%. BMO is the number eight stock, so BMO didn't quite crack the top seven, but hopefully we will soon. Uh, the top seven stocks, so from Royal, you know, you got TD, Shopify, uh, a few other companies, almost identical, 28.4%. So this is this issue of concentration. It's actually one that Canadians have been very used to. It's a little bit new for the U.S., um, but my opinion is this is not such a bad thing. Um, and again, Canadians should be, you know, very much very much used to it. You know, one of the nice things with the market cap index is it's self-rebalancing. Uh, the winners take a greater share of the pie. Now, if like Exxon, you know, a company like Exxon Mobil doesn't have that same growth profile of a tech company over the last 10 years, its weight will fall off. And then the new relative winners will, will, will acquire. So you don't have to always be on top of it, changing from stock to stock. Who's the winner? Who's the loser? It's going to self-rebalance for you and evolve. And I know there's a lot of talk about the Magnificent Seven, but, you know, I always contrast this environment to a 2001 with tech. 2001 tech, there wasn't a lot of meat on the bone, so to speak. There wasn't a lot of substance. There's more style. Now we've got this. Now we've got the, we've got some style, but we've got some substance. So these are mega cap companies that aren't going anywhere. And, you know, I think you do want to remain invested in them. And listen, if one of the fall, one of the seven falls, we'll have something new to talk about because something new will take its place as the index just naturally self-rebalances. And that's kind of the beauty of something like a market cap weighted index, right? We don't have crystal balls. We don't know who the next winners will be. With a market weighted index, you're always exposed to those winners as they gradually grow their market share. Another point I want to highlight that Magnificent Seven, all the companies you mentioned there, Chris, they're all benefiting from that AI growth trend. You talked a lot about some top-down factors that are supporting U.S. equity markets. 
that AI growth trend is not going anywhere. And all those seven companies, including Tesla, are big investors in, in artificial intelligence and that trend as well. So a lot of tailwinds going forward for those big, big mega cap companies. Chris, let's just take a step back. So we talk about the S&P 500. This is a very, very well-known uh, U.S. equity index. But investors out there, they hear about uh, you know other indexes that also represent the U.S. equity market, specifically the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones. So how does the S&P 500 stand apart from that or what does makes it different? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones Industrial, it's it's 30 stocks. Um, it was the original U.S. equity index. And, and the thinking was, well, you would have 30 of the biggest companies. And the way the index works is you just own one share in each, comp in each company. So that's called a price weighted index. Uh, you just own one share in, 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 in the 30 big names. It works. Uh, we do have a couple products at BMO, uh, but in terms of that self rebalancing mechanism, you know, I'd argue the market cap. It's a more fair and dispassionate index weighting approach. Um, so, uh, and in addition, obviously, you've got 500 names instead of 30, which I think is very important. You know, especially as those new names kind of evolve, right? Uh, you know, a lot of this magnificent seven 20 years ago. You know, they're not even on the radar and they evolve into the portfolio. You know, they come from the bottom half of the 500 and then they evolve into the top half and then the top 10. So that's a nice thing I like about the S&P 500 versus the Dow. Um, in terms of the NASDAQ, that uh, that that index and, and, you know, the NASDAQ 100 is index is the one that's most commonly tracked. We track, we track with, you know, with a couple of our ETFs. Um, it's a list of the top names listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, so most of the companies are actually listed in New York, in the New York Stock Exchange, but the NASDAQ just tracks companies listed on the NASDAQ, predominantly tech companies, uh, but not all, not only tech, there's also Costco, there's Pepsi, there's a few biotech companies, um, but by and large, it's like a tech index. So NASDAQ can be very good for a growth investor looking to benefit from tech overall as a theme. And so, you know, it tends to have a higher risk profile than the S&P 500. It's tended to perform better, uh, had a higher return in the last 20 years. Uh, so it's something you can look at, look at if you do have that growth tolerance. But keep in mind, it's more of a tech theme. It's not a sec. I want to. It's not a sector, but it almost trades as if a sector. The S&P 500 is the most diversified benchmark that we have. Um, again, so it, it, it has names that are listed in New York, as well as on the NASDAQ exchange, the biggest 500 names essentially, um, in listed in the U S and broadly diversified by sector. Yes. It's become also more tech focused in recent years as tech has taken a bigger share of the index, but it remains a well diversified index, you know, and it has exposure to companies that, you know, Canadians want to get exposure, like say healthcare companies. We don't have much of a healthcare sector in Canada, you know, U.S. financials, U.S. industrials, some other companies that can help round out a portfolio. So I think, you know, when you're talking about core, that's your, that's your go-to exposures is probably going to be the S&P 500. And of those three indexes you mentioned, Chris, I'd have to argue the S&P 500 has the most global exposure in terms of the revenues from those companies. So if you're looking at just a couple core uh, positions for your portfolio and you are looking at U.S. equities, you know, you think about those magnificent seven companies, they have global revenues. So really reaching beyond the U.S. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, 30 years ago, that might not have been the case. But, you know, now uh, foreign revenues account for about 40 percent of the overall S&P revenue picture. So, you know, yes, you're investing in the U.S., but you're getting some global exposure as well increasingly, but, you know, by investing in still in North America, which can be a nice trade off. Yeah, benefit there for sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about index investing. So there's a lot of people in our audience, they tune in, they, they're they interested in ETFs. A lot of people still like to pick stocks um, and obviously like picking some of those big mega cap companies that you named. What's the argument for index investing? And maybe you can call out some SPIVA reports or some of the data from, not specific data from SPIVA reports, but just, you know, what do those kind of reports tell us about investing in an index and how powerful this can be? 
Yeah, absolutely. And so Spiva reports, you can you can go Google that. It's S P I V A Spiva. Um, and what it does is it measures uh, the performance of, of of active investment strategies versus the index. And uh, you know, as I think a lot of listeners know, uh, the index does very well over time. And you know, um, when you look at longer time frames like five year, ten year, fifteen year time frames, you know, the index, you know, is generally superior returns in in ninety plus percent of of the cases. So. Uh, you know, sometimes active managers can, can, can outperform, but most of the time, uh, the in doubt performs, uh, and you have to ask yourself, well, how, how can that be? Well, there's one big, big challenge that, 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 uh, active managers have is the fees. They charge higher fees. So you have to overcome a fee hurdle before you add to your, to your alpha or your outperformance, you know, our ZSP charges eight basis points. Um, you know, that's a pretty low fee. That's, that's, uh. It's, 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 it's not a high, you know, that's, that's a very low fee. So, so that's one thing active managers have, but, you know, I always say, you know, and I'm, I'm a bit of a quant investor at heart, the discipline, you know, this is a very disciplined index, you know, the, essentially the weights in the index that change, change according to, you know, the market moves instantaneously. So we don't have to figure out, Hey, we need to get long NVIDIA now because it's going to have a good quarter or, you know, they're actually reporting tonight as we record. We don't have to manage things like that. The index self rebalances takes care of that for us. You know, and a lot of times I think as humans, sometimes we get in, in our, in our own way, let's be honest. And I'm, and I count myself included in that, you know, you're better served to just hold a, a good, strong index, the S and P buy and hold, and, you know, it tends to show very well versus the competition over. So how can investors get access to uh, to the S&P 500? Because they can't go out and buy all those 500 stocks. ETFs make this a breeze for investors. Chris, so if an investor is looking to to add S&P 500 to their portfolio, where can they look? Yeah, so ZSP, I think I just, you know, that that that, that ticker is our, uh, that's our BMO S&P 500 index ETF. Uh, we do have a hedge version as well, and I think we're going to touch on that towards the end. So I'll save that ticker for 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 then. But you know, ZSP is the largest uh, ETF in Canada, actually. So um, you know, fourteen billion. So that's you don't you don't have to look far. ZSP is a ticker that trades in Canadian dollars in on the on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and investors can gain the exposure using that as well. Yeah, I think that asset number really shows how popular investing in the S&P 500 really is. It's the biggest ETF in Canada. That means that you're looking like institutional investors, advisors, do-it-yourself investors. Everyone is, um, not everyone, but a lot of investors are looking towards adding that to their portfolio. And and it's now become the largest ETF in Canada, which I didn't even know until recently. So that's that was exciting for us to learn that. Um, it's always nice to, to be number one. And I agree with you. Uh, the performance is certainly a big part of that. You know, on a ten-year basis, ZSP is up on average fourteen percent a year. And we know with the power of compounding, you go up fourteen, you go up another fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. It accumulates over time, so that's a tremendous benefit. But I'd say another thing is the growth of ETFs in general, because that fourteen billion number—that's a big number. Um, and the growth of ETFs. If you look 15 years ago, the entire ETF market was only about 25 billion. So now we're somewhere around 400 billion. The growth of ETFs and the benefits, the low fees, the transparency, the liquidity it's brought to investors, I think is also a nice part of that story. Yeah, all those benefits really resonate with investors. And of course, index investing just simplifies the investing approach for those investors who want to take the guesswork out of it. Okay, before we close out, we're Canadian investors, Chris. Um, we usually trade in Canadian dollars, but when we're looking to invest in U.S. equities, what do we have to think about from a currency perspective? Yeah, so you know, remember, anytime you buy a you know a, an ETF or or a stock or you know an exposure in a foreign country, you know, as a Canadian, you're going to have two sources of return. You're going to have the return of that asset in the local currency. And then you're going to have the currency return. So ZSP is exposed to the U.S. dollar. So essentially what you should expect out of ZSP is the return of the S&P 500 plus the return of the U.S. dollars. 
Now, one thing I'd say is diversification is probably the only free lunch in investing. If you look at the data over time, the US dollar tends to add a diversifying impact to portfolios. So I always like having some port, some of my portfolio with USD exposure and, and the S&P 500 is a logical place to, to take some of that on. Um, but if you are looking to hedge out, uh, you know, the market uh, does offer that as well. So our ticker would be ZUE. So that's the BMO S&P 500 hedge to CAD index ETF. And what that does is that it tries to remove the impact of the currency. So like I said, you have two sources of return, the return of the asset plus the return of the currency. It mitigates the return of the currency. So the hedge product will, you know, be closer to the return of the asset in the local currency. So you could do that for two reasons. You could just say, oh, well, I just have too much US dollars in my portfolio. I need to hedge some of that. You might be looking to do a tactical uh, trade as well. And so we do that. We actually launched, Danielle, we launched Z ZSP uh, when the dollar was close to parity, which was a good time for cross-border shopping. And I, I did enjoy that. Uh, I don't enjoy it as much now, but uh, it was around parity. And, and, and you know, clients said to us, we need an S&P 500 that also has a currency experience. So in that case, they were taking a tactical view on the currency as well as a view on the, you know, the equities under the hood of the S&P 500. So depends how you look at it. But if you want to manage the currency in your portfolio, shift between ZSP and ZUE, and those give you the tools to manage some of that currency exposure. Yeah, and interesting to note, ZUE was actually the first S&P 500 ticker that we listed and, and I, I don't, 2009 or 2010, because that was the way Canadian investors were looking. They were looking to have that hedged exposure. And then, of course, ZSP came to market a few years later when investors were thinking about uh, getting that U.S. dollar exposure as well. And then I'll just tack on, if you are trading in U.S. dollars with a Canadian account, we do have ZSP.U. So that trades in U.S. dollars, but on the Canadian stock exchange. So it's a Canadian asset which uh, benefits investors that have that um, U.S. dollar exposure to invest or U.S. dollars to invest. Chris, this was such a great conversation. Thanks for getting me up to speed on what's going on at the S&P 500. Always a pleasure. Great to be here and uh, happy to come back anytime. Thanks for joining. Great. And thanks to our audience for tuning in. Uh, have a great weekend and we will see you next week. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ETF Market Insights. To stream any previous episode of ETF Market Insights series, please visit youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe and sign up for alerts so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.